All right, let's get started. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming to the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, I'm David Hyman. I'm a professor at Georgetown uh, and an adjunct scholar here at the American Enterprise Institute. I'm just looking at the binder and it says talk for AEI and I just realized it's our speaker's talk so I should focus on my notes rather than hers. Um, uh, Wendy uh, Netter Epstein uh, is a professor of law at DePaul University College of Law and faculty director of the Mary and Michael Jaharis Health Law Institute. Um, she's previously visited uh, at the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, she went to the University of Illinois uh, in Champaign-Urbana and has a JD from some school in Massachusetts that all of you have probably heard of. Um, but uh, it turns out we actually have a somewhat Illinois-centric uh, set of speakers today. More on that uh, when I introduce the rest of the panelists. Uh, but we're here to talk about if we cannot live with the individual mandate, can we cover enough lives without it? And more specifically, um, uh, Wendy's going to talk about her paper, uh, Private Law Alternatives to the Individual Mandate, as I'm sure everyone in the room understands. Uh, the PAPACA, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which goes by a whole series of other names, depending on whether one likes the legislation or doesn't like the legislation, uh, included an individual mandate, uh, which ends up... Uh, uh, repealed is perhaps too strong a word, zeroed out is probably a more accurate description, uh, taking effect uh, in 2019. Uh, and so it sort of remains to be seen what the consequences of that legislative action will be. Uh, some of the states have responded by enacting their own individual mandates. Uh, Massachusetts had one that predated uh, the, the uh, PAPACA. Uh, New Jersey and Vermont and DC have since uh, enacted ones and they've taken effect and California and Rhode Island have also enacted legislation that will take effect in 2020. Uh, that's the sort of latest count on that. Um, and, but Professor Epstein is here to talk about something somewhat different, which is if your state doesn't elect to enact an individual mandate, what are some uh, private law alternatives, uh, self-help if you will, uh, that insurers could engage in to try and address the same issues that the individual mandate was intended to. Uh, and so she's going to talk about uh, this uh, very interesting paper. Uh, and then we've got a, a distinguished panel to come and give their own perspectives on it. And I'll mostly play traffic cop and keep time. So with that, uh, let me give you uh, Professor Wendy Netter Epstein. Thank you, David. Um, and I also I want to thank uh, Tom Miller and the American Enterprise Institute for having this forum today. And I'm going to pre-thank in advance the other panelists, Sherry Westerfield, Tony Lasasso, and Christopher Robertson for what I'm sure is going to be an engaging and productive discussion. So as Professor Hyman already mentioned, um, my talk is on private law alternatives to the individual mandate, which really stems from a paper that I have coming out in the Minnesota Law Review. Um, but this project, uh, the reason that I started working on this um, is I sort of had this feeling that although it's important to have these big grand scale policy discussions on the national stage, both at the right and at the left end of the spectrum, um, that really we were paying insufficient attention to the system that we currently have. Because if history is any indication, we might be looking at a situation of more incremental um, change in our system. And the current system that we have now has plenty of problems that we still need to solve. So um, really what I'm focusing on here and, and what I want to do is kind of start the conversation on how do we deal with this problem of the uninsured population. The individual mandate was, of course, just one prong in a multi-pronged strategy under the Affordable Care Act to try to prompt uh, people to sign up for health insurance, to try to prompt enrollment. Um, you know, we could talk about whether or not it was more impactful versus the subsidies or, you know, versus other aspects of the Affordable Care Act. But really the goal of the system was to move to, um, uh, it was to support this new system where um, people were, where insurance companies were charging community rates and guar were guaranteeing the issuance of policies. And so the individual mandate was trying to prompt insurance uptake. We have this problem now where the mandate has, the, really the mandate penalty, if I'm being precise, has been repealed. And we can talk about how much we think that's going to um, increase the number of uninsureds, but it's likely to increase the, the line at least somewhat. Um, 
Even if you don't think that the repeal of the mandate penalty is going to be that impactful, we still have a problem with the uninsured population. I'm going to put up some numbers in a minute, but even when the mandate was in force, the penalty was in force, we still had upwards of 10% of the population that was uninsured. So how do we go about solving this problem? Well, I think the first thing that we need to do is to spend some time on theory and really understand what it is that is deterring people from signing up for health insurance. Cost is certainly part of that story, but I don't think that it's the only part of the story that's worth discussing. And then once we understand what it is that is uh, keeping people from signing up for health insurance, then we can start talking about some solutions. And really what I'm doing here is just engaging in a thought experiment. I want to define the universe of possibilities, of ways that we can work within the current confines of our laws, of our legal system that we have right now under the Affordable Care Act, to try to prompt uh, people to sign up for policies. And I'm hoping that to the extent that I've, I've missed major options, that the panelists will, will raise those and that all of you will raise some options as well, with the goal of ultimately getting towards a point where we might start experimenting with some of these possibilities. But I'm not going to promote any particular one option over another. I really want to uh, be honest about the pros and cons of the various possibilities. And some of these are ideas that you know, folks have been talking about for a while. And some of these are more creative, more novel ideas. So I'm interested to hear everybody's take on this. OK, so let's talk about the uninsured. And to a certain extent, this is a, a, a story that's well documented. So in the years leading up to the passage of the Affordable Care Act, you can see on the graph behind me that the trend was that the number of uninsured, the percentage of uninsured folks in the population was increasing. Um, the, the highest rate happened in 2010, um, where you can see that over 46 million people were uninsured. Fast forward to the passage of the Affordable Care Act, we see that the number does go down pretty dramatically. Again, we can talk about whether it was the mandate that um, promoted that number to go down, whether it was Medicaid expansion, whether it was the subsidies, it's probably some combination of all of these factors. But we can see that the number goes down to about uh, 26.7 million people in the year 2016. And I don't have the data up here yet, but we know that the, this line is now starting to tick upwards again. So in 2018, the, the trend line is, is moving slightly upwards. And with the repeal of the individual mandate, it seems very likely that that number of uninsured in the population is going to continue to go up. It's really an order of magnitude question, not a whether it will question. So um, why is it that the trend line is going to start to go up with the repeal of the individual mandate? Well, there are a couple of things to keep in mind here. One is that really the Affordable Care Act, sort of the major purpose of this legislation was to try to address the uninsured population. Um, and, and the way that it did that was it moved us from this system that was based on actuarial fairness, that we used to have, uh, no, so I should say I'm putting to the side the employer market and Medicare and Medicaid, and I'm focusing just on the private insurance market, so folks who didn't have access to health insurance through any other mechanisms. So prior to the Affordable Care Act, we had a system that was based on actuarial fairness, where we were trying to match people's rates to their likely claims costs. So if you were somebody who had a pre-existing condition or had a family history that meant that you were likely to have high health care costs, we were going to charge you more. Or we might, uh, if you were an insurance company, you might refuse to cover that population at all. While that was actuarially fair, and we can all, I, I think most of us that would now say that that was morally unfair, that we had a lot of folks in the population that through no fault of their own didn't have access to health care or health insurance. So the Affordable Care Act, in trying to change that, um, implemented these provisions called guaranteed issue. Everybody gets an insurance policy. You can't turn people down just because of a pre-existing condition. And also community rating. So with certain exceptions, um, people were charged basically the same amount regardless of their health history. Um, we could, you know, insurance companies can charge you more based on age. Um, they can charge you more based on smoking status and uh, where you live. But for the most part, the idea was a move towards a more community rating system. Well, that gave us a problem. How were the insurers supposed to pay now that we had a pool of people who had to be covered and we couldn't charge them more money? So the drafters of the Affordable Care Act said, well, the best way to approach this or to handle this situation is to draw healthier people into the risk pools to even out the costs. So I have behind me the ACA's uh, moral commitment to um, covering pre-existing conditions and community rating uh, meant that the healthier were really subsidizing the sicker. That was, that was the idea behind the Affordable Care Act. 
Um, and the mandate was just one way that the drafters of the Affordable Care Act conceived of, um, and, and really it was based on an experiment in Massachusetts that came before that, to try to prompt healthier people to sign up for health insurance. There were other mechanisms as well, and there were, um, you know, a, a very popular provision of the law was allowing people to stay on insurance until, their parents' insurance until they turned 26. Um, we subsidized both the premiums and then also uh, reduced cost sharing for people who made uh, below a certain percentage of the federal poverty level. But there were all these ways that the Affordable Care Act prompted people to purchase insurance. So now that that mandate, the penalty has been repealed, there's less of an incentive for healthy people to purchase insurance. I don't want to forget to mention that the subsidies are probably also a very important part of this, of this story. Okay, so if you look at the graphic behind me, um, the orange represents the uh, sick people and the blue represents the healthy people. And this is just a way of depicting that post-implementation of the Affordable Care Act, in theory, our risk pools were supposed to look something like this. Sick people and healthy people all mixed together in one risk pool. Some are more expensive, some are cheaper. If you average it out, then the premiums were supposed to be um, palatable for most of the population. Um, Post-mandate world, and I guess that really that should say post-repeal of the individual mandate penalty. Um, uh, the mandate, of course, still exists, but the penalty has been zeroed out. Um, and I'll simply point out that without a penalty for failure to purchase health insurance, some number of healthy people will choose not to purchase insurance. Okay, there's a, a lot of very smart economists who are doing a lot of projections um, about and actuaries about um, you know, how many people really won't purchase health insurance, particularly given that the subsidies are still in place. But some number of healthy people are going to leave these risk pools. So what does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with a risk pool that um, has more sick people in it than healthy people. And uh, costs of that risk pool, of course, are going to be higher relative to one that includes more cheaper uh, healthy people in it. And with that, premiums are going to go up people will fall out of the insurance markets. Um, I, just, I guess I want to flag that, as Professor Hyman stated, I'm not really here to debate the merits of the individual mandate. The ship has sailed on that, uh, at least for now. But uh, whether or not you think that the mandate was a good idea, um, this, this trend line of increasing numbers of uninsured is really what I want to focus on. And I guess just to emphasize again that even in a world with the mandate, we still never solved this problem. There were still um, such a, a large number of people who didn't have health insurance. Okay, so um, why should we be concerned about the fact that there are large numbers of uninsureds? And I'll just be brief about this, but I think that there are reasons both at the individual level and for the market that it's bad to have high numbers of, of uninsured in the population. So at the individual level, in many studies, including a seminal one conducted by the Institute of Medicine, uninsured individuals have been found to experience worse health outcomes um, than those who do have insurance. And of course, the financial consequences for an individual who um, experiences high health costs and can't pay for them are also can be quite uh, catastrophic. So uh, both the health outcome level and the financial impact uh, are concerns of the for the individuals. But then also the market. So um, high rates of uninsurance are also problematic there. When people show up in the emergency room and they can't afford to pay for their care, but EMTALA, for the most part, requires that the emergency room doctors treat them, well, that cost has to be absorbed somewhere, and it's either going to be borne by people who are insured or by the government. Um, so we have adverse spillover effects to consider. And then there's also the concern we already discussed about sicker risk pools and rising premiums. Okay, so high rates of uninsurance are bad, particularly if the uninsured cannot afford medical expenses. And before we talk about possible solutions, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about um, why it is that people aren't signing up for health insurance. And number one on this list is always cost. So I have just an example of a study up behind me. Um, and I, you know, I say this is, this is sort of the, the part of the talk where I'm going to draw on neoclassical economic theory. But really what I want to emphasize is that I think in every study I've ever seen that asked people who are uninsured why they're uninsured, why they have not signed up for an insurance policy, um, the fact that cost is too high is number one on the list. Okay? Now, I wish that these studies parsed the fact that cost is too high down to a, a, a lower level, because I think that that can mean, practically speaking, different things for different people. So um, those of you that engage in, in empirical studies, you know, if, if you want to 
follow up on a study like this. This is really what I want to know. I want to know what percentage of people who say cost is too high legitimately cannot pay, right? They would have to give up being able to pay for housing or being able to pay for food in order to get health insurance. And housing and food is always going to take precedence over having health insurance, and that's why they don't buy a policy. But my guess is that a high percentage of people that say cost is too high really mean the bottom part here, right? Where I said for others, the cost is too high relative to the risk of health expenses. So this is a you know, vastly oversimplified example, but if you're a person looking at the prospect of buying a health insurance policy and you see that your premiums are going to cost you $6,000 a year, but you think you're only likely to have $500 a year in health care expenses, you might say to that study, I don't have health insurance because cost is too high. But really what you mean is that you've engaged in a cost-benefit analysis where you've considered um, both what you consider to be your risk and your risk profile, how risk-averse you are, and you've decided that it's not worth it. Okay. Um, a lot of times the analysis ends there, and I think that that's wrong. I think that we need to go further than just the question of cost and look at some of the behavioral economic reasons that people don't purchase health insurance. Okay? The reason that I think cost is not the entirety of the story, although I do think it is an important part of the story, is that there are lots of people who are not signing up for health insurance, even though it would be basically free for them to get it, either because they have very large subsidies on, um, through the private market, uh, perhaps they could get Medicaid and they're choosing not to sign up for it. There may be some objections to signing up for Medicaid based on reasoning other than cost. Um, but there seems to be good reason to at least believe that people are not signing up for health insurance for reasons other than just the cost. And so I'll, I'll, I'll run through these kind of quickly because I want to make sure that there's time to get to um, the discussion about the potential solutions. Um, but let me just start with this misperception of risk and optimism bias. So one of the most robust findings in behavioral economics is that people have difficulty evaluating probabilities. So they underestimate high likelihood events and they overestimate the prospect of low likelihood events. And optimism bias is just one type of, uh, of misperception of risk. So in the context of healthcare, this probably won't surprise too many people in the room, but particularly young people, we have this term young invincibles that people in health policy circles often use to describe this population, but they often feel that they're unlikely to have to incur high medical expenses, um, even if that's not a realistic assessment of the risk of that, of that possibility. Um, also, uh, there's a sense that people have this, this illusion of control. If you are a healthy person now, um, and, and you're, you're young, and you eat healthy, and you exercise, you think, well, I'm not somebody who's ever going to incur health expenses, because you can control that. And of course, that's only true to a degree, right? There's, there's still, um, you know, unfortunately, car accidents or somebody that gets hurt engaging in athletic activity and there are all sorts of reasons that people can incur high health expenses, um, even if they're, they're young and healthy. Just some interesting numbers here. According to the US Census, 55% of Americans without health insurance are under the age of 35, and 72% are under the age of 45. So many of these people likely think that by paying premiums, they're essentially throwing away their money because they're not going to have to use their health insurance. Um, hyperbolic discounting and regret bias is second on the slide behind me. And so here I'm referring to the fact that people tend to prefer uh, immediate gratification, even at the expense of longer run well-being. So it's really hard to pay out hard-earned money now for uh, the, the possibility that down the road you're going to get a benefit from the health insurance company. There's just a lot of uncertainty there. People put too much weight on costs today and too little weight on future benefits. Um, framing effect, I'm going to talk about when I um, uh, make this suggestion in a few minutes about generosity as a better way to frame the sale of health insurance. Uh, but right now, most health insurance is being sold as a rational economic decision. And of course, we know that a good percentage of young, healthy people would not be making a rational economic decision to purchase health insurance despite the risk uh, because they are explicitly subsidizing the cost of, of uh, sicker and more expensive individuals. It isn't a good deal for them. Um, so the framing effects might really matter there. Uh, status quo bias, uh, this is the idea that people tend to stick with the default or tend to stick with what they already have. Of course, the default is not to have health insurance. You have to actually go through a lot of work, <laughs> wade through a lot of options in order to purchase a health insurance policy. So um, there's a certain inertia to just staying with what you have. 
And then finally, this idea of choice overload and complexity. So um, here, there have been lots of studies that have shown that while we may have assumed that more choices are better, you reach a point where people have too many choices and they choose not to engage in the decision-making exercise at all because they're simply overwhelmed by the complexity. Um, and I think that that can be a real challenge in uh, the context of buying health insurance, particularly where um, literacy about what, uh, how, pr how plans are priced and, and people's understanding about uh, deductibles and co-pays and co-insurance um, is, is not necessarily ideal. Okay. So the question is, if both too high of cost and also this list of uh, really cognitive biases is impacting people's decision not to buy health insurance, well, what can be done about that? So here I have a menu. I'm going to just highlight four possible solutions today. And again, I'm hoping that the panel might have other ideas that they're going to suggest as well. Um, but let me start first with this idea of low introductory rates with uh, long-term policies and exit penalties. Okay, so here I'm really uh, co-opting a commercial practice that has been used with a lot of success in other contexts um, for poor reasons, with bad results, right? So of course I'm thinking here now of the subprime mortgage crisis. Uh, mortgage companies sold people mortgages that offered this really appealing low introductory rate that later ballooned, and because, precisely because of the behavioral biases that we just talked about, uh, people purchased these mortgages, even though in that context they shouldn't have, and it led to very poor results for the market. Okay? In this context, though, but, but I guess the thing to flag is that um, this commercial practice was successful. It got people to, to buy these policies. And so I wonder if there's a way to do something similar for health insurance where the result is something that we seek, that we want. We want people to enroll in health insurance. So what if we gave them a discount to prompt enrollment, offered them sort of a low introductory rate, and then gave a longer term policy that had a limited exit right? Okay, so I've listed here some of the reasons why I think that this might work. So I think that it addresses some of the short term affordability concerns, um, particularly for younger people who um, you know, are looking at these premium rates and are thinking that they're too high. Um, and it sort of takes advantage of this difficulty that people have with uh, understanding the fact that these prices are going to go up later and what impact that might have. I think that these rates would clearly need to be disclosed. We would need to have a schedule of rates so that people are not um, experiencing rate increases that they weren't informed of. Um, so it takes advantage also of these time inconsistent preferences. And, um, and so this last bullet under why it might work, I say, um, gives insurers the incentive to focus on long-term health. So I think this is actually a really interesting aspect of a long-term health insurance plan. So right now, of course, the norm is for plans to only last for a year. And there's relatively high churn rates in the health insurance industry. People uh, move from uh, insurer to insurer. Uh, if you consider the employer market, where um, almost half of the population gets their health insurance, you move jobs, you get a different insurance company. And it gives us this sort of weird incentive that health insurers, and I should note that health, private health insurers also understand that when you reach the age of 65, you're going to be moving on to Medicare. So there's this weird incentive to focus on relatively short-term health and choosing um, you know, what to cover as a, a medically necessary expense. Um, health insurance companies don't necessarily have the incentive to look at that particular insured 10 years down the road um, and determine if that person's healthier 10 years down the road. They are really focused very much on the, the policy time frame. Now, of course, it's not just the one year because many people will have policies for longer than that. But there is this weird incentive to focus on short-term health. And if you had longer-term policies, that would change that incentive. So in a sense, it will align the incentives of both the um, insured and the insurer because the insured wants to be healthier over the course of, of a longer term policy and the insurer wants the insured to have lower health care expenses. Um, so I think that's sort of an, an interesting sort of side uh, uh, a benefit of that. Of that. Um, okay, some concerns, some reasons that I, I think that this may not work. Um, and actually, I was talking to Sherry Westerfield about this when we were uh, getting ready for this panel. And she said to me, and I'm sure she's going to talk about this in her remarks, that 
uh, from an insurance company's perspective and the perspective of an actuary that they view the private market as um, a sort of a transitional market. People are not intending to stay in this private market for the long term. They're hoping to return to employer-sponsored insurance or you know, maybe they'll be moving on to Medicare. And so one possibility is, is that people won't necessarily want long-term policies because the, they're viewing their place in this private market as relatively short-lived. Um, you know, I think that's probably true to a degree, um, but I'm also wondering about the increasing number of workers who are participating in the gig economy, who are uh, private contractors, who are looking at the prospects of never getting insurance through work, who know they're going to be in this private market for the longer term. Um, so I think that that's at least something to look into. A uh, question about whether or not insurers can price policies accurately over a longer term. And I think this is a, a big one, a big area of concern. Um, you know, one of the reasons for one-year insurance policies now is that there's so much volatility in pricing and in, in health care, and insurance companies don't necessarily know from year to year if they're going to see big spikes because some expensive new technology has come out that they have to cover or some expensive new drug has come out that they have to cover. And so I think there's a concern that if insurance companies have to price something over a longer term, are they going to uh, uh, cautiously or conservatively price it higher um, just in case they have high medical expenses? And so I think that that's something that um, uh, you know, people who are working for the insurance companies would really have to look at very closely, the extent to which they can accurately predict costs. And maybe 10 years is just too long. Maybe three years is a better uh, uh, length or even five years to look at for that. Um, reduced competition is potentially a problem. So if insureds have a policy for 10 years and have limited right of exit and can't go elsewhere because they're unhappy after year one, um, and that's something that could be problematic. Um, again, there, I think the alignment of incentives might help mitigate that effect a little bit, that the insurance companies care about uh, healthier insureds over the longer period because it also reduces their costs. Uh, but that's certainly a, a possible concern. And then I just wanted to flag that although I'm, I'm pitching these as private law responses that could be done now, this one does have some legal changes that would need to be made. Right now, the Affordable Care Act only allows insurers to charge older people three times as much as younger people. So if you wanted to offer younger people a really significant discount, you could only do it up to three times of, of older people. So that might need to be changed. And um, I, I, I've looked a, a lot to see if there are any laws about uh, employer-sponsored insurance having to be offered as one-year policies. I haven't found that any. I'd be curious if other folks are aware. Uh, but in the private market, um, under the Affordable Care Act, there are some laws about the open enrollment periods that would require policies to be one year. Although I think probably the norm about open enrollment and people's expectations about one year insurance policies might be a bigger hurdle to jump over than, um, than the legal changes here. Um, okay, so another possible solution. So this I'm titling a return of premium policy. And I'm drawing on some earlier work from Tom Baker and Peter Siegelman here. It really, we're all collectively drawing on something that's sold in the life insurance context, the term life insurance context. And what generally happens there is that you might be interested in buying a term life insurance policy for 15 years or 30 years, but you're a relatively young person. You don't think it's likely that you're going to die in the next 15 years or 30 years. You're worried about whether it makes sense to even get this insurance policy at all because you think you're just throwing away the premiums. You get nothing at the end if you're still alive at the end of 15 or 30 years. So in the insurance context, they came up with this product where they do charge you a percentage, they do charge you higher premiums over the course of your policy, you know, between maybe 15 and 30 percent higher premiums. But then at the end of the policy, if you're still alive, they return those premiums to you. So it basically works like a loan to the insurance company. The insurance company is investing those premiums over the course of the uh, policy. So I wonder if something similar might be able to be done in health insurance as a way to uh, address the concern that younger people think that they're paying premiums that they're basically throwing away. And it couldn't work exactly the same way as in life insurance because you wouldn't want to deter people from um, engaging in preventive health care that's going to make them healthier over the long run, over the long term. 
Um, and you couldn't return 100% of the premiums because you would have to account for those costs. And of course, there will be some young, healthy people that you bring into the risk pool who then will have high healthcare expenses. So the numbers on this sort of need to work out. And I will defer to uh, the, the actuaries and the economists amongst us to tell me if this is really possible. Um, but the idea is that you would promise to return some percentage of the premium to people who do not use healthcare expenses outside of the preventative healthcare context at the end of their policy term. Um, Okay, so what are the possible concerns here? Um, one is that this does sort of run counter to the fact that people are concerned about cost in the short term because you do have to charge um, higher premiums or I suppose just return a smaller percentage of the premium at the end of the policy in order to make the math work. Um, also, there's a question of what percentage to return and still cover the high cost of some, which I've already mentioned. And then I guess finally the, the other concern is that to the extent I told you earlier that one problem with our current system is that it's too complicated and that people don't necessarily understand all of the options and that by making it too complicated, people opt out, well, this is sort of a complicated solution, right? People have to understand um, what it is that's being offered to them by the insurance company, um, and I'm creating more options here, so something to keep in mind. Um, so this one I, I'm, I'm particularly excited about. <laughs> so. Um, I'm titling this Generosity Framing. And really, what got me thinking about this was I was looking at the national uh, polls, the numbers, about the percentage of people who now support these guaranteed issue and community rating provisions in the Affordable Care Act, the, these protections against you know, discriminating against people that have pre-existing conditions. The numbers are extraordinarily high. The uh, majority of the population supports these provisions that protect people uh, and say that we can't uh, refuse to issue them an insurance policy or charge them more, okay? Which is great, I think that that's important. But that has to be paid for somehow. <laughs> Either it's paid for in increased taxes or it's paid for by healthy people buying insurance policies the way the Affordable Care Act was designed to work so that we don't just have increasingly sicker, more expensive risk pools to cover. So I thought, what if we were just um, more honest about that and the selling of insurance policies? That if you're a young, healthy person, um, this is a generous thing to do, to buy an insurance policy. Let's sort of trade on that uh, desire to be altruistic, to do something good. And this is a, a kind of a big trend, particularly in commercial companies that are uh, pitching their products to millennials now. And so I've put a couple of examples up on the slide behind me. Tom's Shoes and Bomba Socks, although this could be a very long list of products, but those are both products where they're inflating the price a little bit. You're paying more for your Tom's shoes. You're paying more for your Bomba socks than you would be if they just sold the product outright. But they're promising that because you're paying a little bit more, they're donating a pair of shoes to somebody in need. They're donating a pair of socks to somebody in need. And these companies, at least to this point, have been quite successful in trading on this desire to be generous or to be altruistic. Um, so it's possible that we could do something similar to this in health insurance. We could just say to people, listen, maybe it's not a rational economic decision to buy health insurance. It's always good to be protected. You never know if you're going to be somebody who um, gets into an accident and has very high health expenses, and it's certainly a good thing to have health insurance. But yeah, you're paying a little bit more than you would be if we weren't also um, saying that insurance companies can't charge sicker people more money. Um, concerns about this, okay, so certainly there are some people who uh, are not going to be influenced by the generosity or altruistic frame, although I think there are some that will. Um, uh, it's, but I think the two bigger concerns are it's sort of different to say that you're paying a little more for a pair of shoes than it is to say you're paying for a whole year of premiums, different orders of magnitude. So when I say generosity threshold, that's really what I'm referring to there. And then my other concern is just the general distrust of insurers. You hear um, lots of candidates for president in 2020 um, talking about both the big bad pharmaceutical companies and the big bad health insurers. And I think that there is a certain percentage of the population that wouldn't necessarily believe that um, the health insurers are going to be doing something generous and altruistic. Um, although perhaps this is a good opportunity for a new market entrant who would come in and, and sort of market themselves as an alternative to those companies who's being um, honest about the fact that this is the way that their health insurance is priced, that they need healthy people to balance out the costs of sicker people. Okay, 
Um, one last possibility, and again, this is not a new one. I think everybody's heard or discussed with others the idea that we could auto-enroll people in health insurance. So this trades on the status quo bias, um, which says that people tend to stick with the default. So if there's a certain inertia that is keeping people from signing up for health insurance because the status quo is not to have it, well, we could change that default. We could take people who are uninsured and we could automatically enroll them in a policy with the right to opt out, of course. Um, there are some things in the way of this auto-enrollment. And I should note, by the way, that there is some auto-enrollment going on already, particularly in the individual market, there's auto-re-enrollment. So if you have signed up for a policy through the private exchanges, um, you are automatically re-enrolled in that policy in the next year with the right to, to opt out. But we're not automatically enrolling people in the first instance. And I think there's a couple of hurdles to this. One is that um, it's just identifying the people to enroll in the policies in the first place. There are certain decision points, perhaps, that we could use. There are certain data um, from the tax system that we could use um, to try to identify which people to enroll in policies. Um, but a, a couple of other concerns are, uh, in addition to the data problem, is ability to pay. So if we enroll people, automatically enroll people in a policy, and um, they don't have the ability to pay the premiums, what happens, they're basically going to immediately lapse from that policy. Um, although, again, you know, this is sort of a, uh, you know, a perfect versus a good situation, right? If there are some people that we're automatically enrolling who aren't going to lapse, who are going to pay the premiums, then maybe we've improved upon the current situation, even if there's going to be a certain percentage of people who lapse. Um, and finally, just you know, the possibility that this is too paternalistic of a solution. Um, you know, we're, we're sort of forcing people into these policies, although I guess I'll just emphasize that this does give people the right to opt out. OK, I think my time is up. I'll just note that um, I've, I've started this as a thought experiment. I want to start a conversation. I hope that there'll be some experimentation. I hope that we might try implementing some of these solutions. Um, and with that, I will turn it over back to Professor Hyman. All right, so we have uh, four distinguished uh, panelists to comment on it, and I think we're going to try and reshuffle the uh, seats up here so that at the end people can uh, uh, sit as a panel and discuss this more broadly. But Tom, you want me to introduce everybody now and we'll get started, or do you want to take a short break? Uh, don't take a short break. Don't exit. Everyone will leave. All right. Here. All right. So I will encourage whoever's responsible for the chairs to start doing that. And in the meantime, I'll start introducing um, our four panelists. Um, so first up uh, is going to be Chris Robertson, uh, who is a professor at the University of Arizona. That's the one in Tucson, not the one in Tempe. Much nicer in Tucson, by the way. Uh, he's the associate dean for research and innovation there. Um, he's also affiliated with the Petri Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at some school in Boston, which is also where he went to sc law school. Um, he also has a PhD in philosophy from Wash U, um, and he was born in Illinois. So we're going to uh, cover uh, the, the Illinois connections for everyone here, uh, including me, as it happens. Um, then uh, next up uh, after uh, Chris uh, will be uh, Tony Lasasso. Uh, who is a professor and dry house fellow at DePaul University, the same institution as Professor Epstein. Um, until recently, he was a professor at the University of Illinois. Um, he's an economics professor at uh, DePaul University. Uh, in fact, when I got the announcement, my reaction was uh, Tom made a mistake, because I remember Tony being at the U of I, uh, where I was also a professor, once again, Illinois. And he currently lives in Illinois. Um, third up is uh, Sherry Westerfield, who's Senior Vice President and Chief Actuary at Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, where she oversees the pricing of health insurance products. Um, she lives in Chicago uh, and uh, uh, has been there for quite some time as well. Uh, and uh, then our fourth speaker uh, is Tom Miller, uh, who is a scholar here at the American Enterprise Institute, attended some school in North Carolina, and as far as I know, has no connections whatsoever with Illinois. Um, but I'm, all right. I, 
I stand corrected, uh, so you can use some of your 10 minutes to talk about that particular issue. Um, so we, each of uh, the panelists will offer their perspective on this, and then we'll have a little bit of back and forth, and then we'll go to the audience for questions, comments, reactions. Uh, when we do that, I want to encourage, and I'll just say this now, and I'm going to say it again later, because one of the things I've learned as a professor is repetition is very important uh, in getting your message across. So questions um, or comments, not speeches, uh, from the, uh, the audience. Um, and if you want to argue about uh, the desirability of Medicare for all or anything like that, this is really not the venue for that. We'd be happy to talk with you separately about that. But for now, I'd ask you to focus uh, on Professor Epstein's uh, very interesting paper. So with that, let me turn it over to Chris. Thank you. I'm, I'm really honored to, to be part of this conversation. And you know, um, Wendy started out her, or ended her, her talk saying that we need to do some experimentation on these issues. And sure enough, Wendy has sort of uh, performed a classic Tom Sawyer move and persuaded me to join her in doing some of that experimentation. So we'll, I'll be sharing with you some research that's sort of not even hot off the presses. Um, it's hot from the field. We were literally collecting this data last week and uh, trying to do some quick analyses so we have something to share with you today. So um, on that note, we really wanted to, to, to move the ball one small step forward in talking about whether these new reforms can be put into practice, what they would even look like if they were described to consumers, um, how we wanted to get some preliminary sense of how consumers might respond to these sorts of ideas. And if we do see a positive response, we'd like to at least get some sense of the scale because um, some of these are quite complicated and expensive and, uh, and we want to have a sense of whether they're really a, a substitute to the individual mandate. Um, and, and so that, that sense of uh, scaling the effect is, is the direction we're going in this research. So uh, there's a lot on this slide, and I have a few minutes, but we did a, uh, a blinded, between subjects, randomized, uh, vignette-based survey experiment. And a vignette, is a, a vignette survey experiment is a method of research where you recruit people, and rather than just asking their opinion on some issue, you ask them to put themselves in a, in a rather extensive situation that you describe in some depth, and then ask, what would you do in that situation? And here the situation was, um, you're an uninsured person, uh, and everyone who recruited for the study was actually uninsured. Um, and we asked them, you know, imagine you're presented with this health insurance policy that we describe in some detail, including the cost-sharing profile and whether your doctors are in network and, and, and pro provide uh, a premium price. Uh, and then we say, would you buy that insurance policy? And we measure that on what's called a Likert scale um, uh, from a 1 to 7, where 7 is extremely likely to buy. And so we screened these uh, respondents. We had 551 respondents from an online um, uh, surveying uh, service provided by a company called Dynata. And um, we had them also explain their decisions. And so we screened out the people that didn't seem engaged at all or who went through the survey uh, ridiculously fast. Um, and, and then we manipulated um, the experiment in five different ways. Again, it was blinded. So we didn't emphasize to the respondents which kind of condition they were in. We just described um, the insurance plan. The base case was, uh, as I already described, a plan with, I think, a $2,000 deductible and a maximum cost exposure. Uh, and we adjusted the premium based on um, nationwide average premiums that turns out this is really complicated to put it even in practice because premiums are adjusted for, for family size, for income, for age, but we tried to give a relatively realistic view uh, of a premium. And then we tried um, uh, four manipulations on top of that base case. One was the return of premiums uh, mechanism that Wendy described, and again, here we're just Taking those initial steps of putting it into practice, we assumed that the premium would be 20% higher for everyone, but if you went through a whole year without any medical expenses other than preventative care, you would get 80% of that back. Um, in another version of the case, we tried this long-term premium plan. Here we specified there'd be a decade long. Those teaser rates Wendy described, we put into practice as a half premium for the first three years. It went to a normal size premium for the middle uh, uh, three years, and in the last um, four years, it went to uh, double premiums. Um, so it had this sort of teaser rate feature, and we imposed a cancellation penalty of one year of normal premiums. 
We also tested this generosity frame. We created a little logo that says one healthy person equals one sick person and explained that this is, in a paragraph, this is your way of doing your part to make sure that we can cover people that have pre-existing conditions. And finally, we wanted to, as a sense of scale, uh, we want a sense of, of how this compared to just giving people money, like putting money on the table. And so we implemented that with a $500 annual subsidy. We chose that price point because it took our lowest income group's premiums from $48 a month to $8 a month for this full health insurance plan. As Wendy said, it makes it essentially free for them. Okay, so what we're all looking for then is the results, uh, what happened, um, and um, here's our main findings by experimental condition. Uh, we found about half the people in our sample said they would be likely to buy the insurance plan they were presented, but whether that went up or down did uh, depend somewhat on the um, experimental condition. You can see these little uh, uh, thread lines above and below, those are 95% confidence intervals. And so where they overlap uh, in this small initial study, that means we can't rule out uh, the possibility of, of due to chance. It's essentially a margin of error. We found that the long-term plans were not particularly attractive to people, nor did the subsidy seem to make any difference. But the return of premium and the generosity frames both seem to be driving respondents to be slightly more likely to purchase the plan, um, eight or 10% additional people uh, on the margin. We then sought to break this down uh, by income, by age, by health status. And I think this income slide is probably the most interesting. Um, the group in the, in the left is the base case. What you'll notice there is the relatively wealthier people are less likely to buy the health insurance. Why would that be? It's because, as I said, we implemented the um, subsidies that we see in the Affordable Care Act. So those people were getting relatively poor deals compared to the people in the lower income bands. But you'll notice the generosity frame essentially um, corrects that. And you can see it right here, the, the gray and yellow bars come up so that the wealthier people seem to be now buying insurance at about the same rate as the poorer people, even though it's not subsidized at all um, uh, for the wealthiest individuals and only somewhat for those below. So that's the, I think, most interesting story on this slide. Um, for age, uh, we, uh, we see different uh, responses, uh, potentially, uh, at different uh, uh, price points. We see um, the older people being the least interested, for example, in the long-term plans, um, um, but uh, not a lot of action here, I think. But uh, another interesting finding with regard to health, uh, we don't see huge evidence on this method of adverse selection. Oddly, you should expect the sickest people flocking to the insurance because they have the private information that the insurer doesn't have. They should be uh, exploiting the fact that they're going to be a bigger user. Uh, we're actually not seeing that in this sample. That's both a worry for our research method that we're not seeing it, but on the other hand, it suggests that insurance purchases are not purely rational decisions. People are deciding with all sorts of heuristics and, and biases. So um, I think our, 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 our big findings, to the extent we can boil anything down at this point, or, is that the implicit subsidies are not working uh, uh, in our sample the way we might hope. Uh, we think that one hypothesis is, the way that is, is that consumers may actually see a price value link. There's a lot of research that people infer the quality of a product by the price on the product. So if I tell you that you're taking a very expensive drug, you will tend to think the drug is highly efficacious. That might be what's happening here when you bake subsidies into a premium price. People are like, wow, I'm not gonna get much out of this insurance plan. I don't understand, you know, I can't see what they're gonna call medical necessity. I can't actually evaluate whether my future doctors will be in the plan. I don't understand even what a deductible or a copay is. So they might use a very simple, simple heuristic there. We don't see a lot of excitement in long-term plans. You know, um, people, if you ask what's your favorite thing about your credit card, is it that they lock you into a multi-year contract? No, you know, that's probably not uh, what excites people about their cell phone contracts or other things as well. We're not seeing that excitement here either. Again, we could go back to this and qualitative and maybe do some focus groups and review people's explanations to see why. The return of premium policy seems really interesting. I think it's something that we're uh, excited about looking at further. Of course, the devil is in the details and figuring out how much of the premium is actually going to get returned in a sustainable way. And the last finding that's pretty exciting, I think, is actually the generosity frame because it is relatively simple. It's a few words on pieces of paper, 
um, saying that, hey, here's a different reason to think about buying insurance. Um, and like we saw, there's maybe a 10% shift in likelihood. That's not enough to achieve anywhere near universal health insurance coverage, but it's kind of interesting that it's able to shift some people towards buying. So in my last minute, I'll mention we have a range of limitations for this sort of study we can talk about in, in greater detail. One limitation is we haven't even had full time to analyze the data. We haven't done the multivariate regressions and things that would be really interesting to tease apart the different effects. Um, um, you know, uh, uh, we are really viewing this as a pilot study, um, something that would like to go back with a larger budget and a larger sample and, and, and a second round of fleshing out what these proposals look like. But it's enough, it's the kind of thing that can address, address um, where to spend our time and resources next. So with that, I want to uh, close and thank you and also want to plug my book that's coming out in December on the related topics of cost exposure in health insurance. One thing I did see in going through our data already is that a lot of people said, I don't want to buy this plan because I couldn't afford the $2,000 deductible. This isn't real in health insurance for me. Um, so that's the sort of question that I explore in this book called Exposed, which is coming out this December. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I'm Tony Lasasso. Um, I um, I'm also at DePaul University, and uh, you know we shouldn't. Uh, Wendy and I shouldn't have to travel to D.C. in order to see each other because she's like literally in the building next door. But but since we're here, it's good to see Wendy and uh, and all of you. Um, I mean, in general, you know, you typically. Um, you typically invite an economist to a party when you want somebody to pee into the punch bowl, um, in a metaphorical sense there. Uh, uh, and so, you know, so I, I, I actually, I want to start by saying, you know, I think, I think Wendy's paper does a really nice job, a, a terrific job, really, of, uh, of, of presenting the issues and uh, on this really important topic. I, I think the paper itself is Extremely useful, uh, really interesting to read. Uh, I, I think it'll probably be on my syllabus for uh, an upcoming health policy class that I'm that I'm that I'm planning uh, to teach. So, and, and then and then you know, I, as an economist, I, I I like that she takes the economics behind this issue seriously. Um, so, but but I do I do want to make a few points though, just. Um, uh, along those lines, just around kind of the economics, because I, I think that's where that's where I, I, I guess you know there's maybe some room for for improvement or clarification. Um, you know, the 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 first issue really is uh, uh, just around the nature of insurance, and and uh, and and it just it, it need, we we need reminders. You know, like 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 David said, I mean, you know. Uh, uh, re repetition is your friend here, especially on this issue, that, that, that insurance only works when there's risk present. Okay, r r risk means that, you know, th there are unknowns and, and they are symmetrically unknown by, by both parties to the transaction. We, we have long history of an old literature looking at the market for, for lemons, Rothschild, Stiglitz, Nobel Prizes have been given about how markets break down when there's asymmetry of information. Uh, and, and so, you know, it, it, and of course, it, it's always easy to, uh, uh, to, predict, uh, to predict things when they've already happened. Uh, at least, you know, uh, I, I can appreciate that. Because uh, those are generally, the, I said easier also. But, uh, but, but there's no risk when a bad outcome has already happened. Um, and, and I think, you know, pe people seem to get this, I think, for auto and, and, and uh, home and life insurance. You know, they get that you can't buy uh, a life insurance policy after you die. There's at least one, yeah, more than one reason for that too, but uh, being dead being, you know, central. But nevertheless, uh, auto insurance, you, you can't buy, people get, you can't buy an auto insurance policy to cover the accident that, you, that happened to you yesterday, okay? Um, homeowners, you, you get the idea. So that said, you know, I am not surprised, and, and Wendy pointed this out, that people are very quick and nearly unanimous in their support of, of covering people with pre-existing conditions. Because, you know, they're not heartless economists, mostly, all right? 
Um, and so, uh, uh, and, and, and it's a compassionate reaction, and, and, I, and I can at least at an abstract level understand that uh, as a heartless economist. Um, so, you know, I, it, so, so it's, it's I, I do think, though, that if, if the question around that was framed differently, this is my little plug here, I've never tried this, um, but, uh, you know, if, if it would probably be a lot less popular if the phrasing was different. You know, are, are you, although it's a testable hypothesis, are, are you willing to pay $2,000 more uh, because someone chose not to have insurance, for your insurance policy, for some, because someone chose not to have insurance uh, and then got sick? I think, the, I think it'd be less popular. I'm just going to make a directional prediction there. I don't know how much less popular, but less popular. Um, it, it may still be the moral thing to do, and, and Wendy dropped the, the M word. I mean, she should you know, have a, actually a trigger warning for economists in the room when the word moral pops out, unless you're talking about moral hazard, which is a very significant issue in health insurance, uh, but that's for another time. Um, so, so I really think that the bigger issue is how she actually frames it here. She frames it as, for the ACA to work, Healthy people must enroll. Makes sense. OK, but not quite. It's slightly more nuanced than that. It's, it works if people with unrealized health problems enroll, some of whom will get sick, some of whom won't get sick. When you, when you include, so, so the fatal flaw, I think, in the law is that from a policy design standpoint, is that you're, you're in effect rewarding this irresponsible behavior, okay? That is, you know, there's no penalty to wait to get sick to get, until you get your policy. And so the irresponsibility begets further irresponsibility because you don't want to be the, the chump who gets into the market and buys a policy subsidizing the people who are being irresponsible. So that might be a little harsh. But I don't have a lot of time, so, and I do think then that you know no amount of uh, no amount of trickery, uh, and not that her solutions are trickery, but uh, but I will say I'll just add this you know when when in the paper she didn't say this in her talk but in the paper she references pricing strategies used by the by the cable TV industry. Well, I mean you know th there are very few industries that are more hated than health insurance. Cable TV is one of them. So you don't want to reference, you don't want, you don't want to go there, I think. So in terms of referencing, you know, winning strategies to, to get more customers and, and, and win more friends. Um, but but I, I don't think that any amount of, of, of adjustments to framing is going to fundamentally push this rock up that hill. Because there is this fundamental problem of, of people without insurable health care needs being thrust into a health insurance market. Those are two, that's a fundamental incompatibility. Because when the risk has been revealed, it's not insurable anymore. Just like the car crash that happened to you yesterday, it's not insurable. Just like the house that burned down yesterday, sorry, not insurable. And people get it there. For healthcare, you know, all right, we have hearts, I get it, but we can't let our soft hearts infect our, and, and become soft heads as we go along with this process. So, um, so uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, of interesting, you know, of, uh, and, and again, I, I, there's, well, there is, it's not all bad news. I've got a minute or two left. It's not all bad news because, you know, um, uh, and this is a public service announcement, not a positive one, really, but, uh, but a, public, a PSA nonetheless that, uh, uh, we can at least take some comfort in the fact that, that health insurance isn't going to make you healthier any more than auto insurance is going to make you a better driver or life insurance is going to make you live longer. It doesn't work that way. Um, and if you need experimental evidence, we've got it. Uh, it, it experiments have been conducted. The, the RAND health insurance experiment found that the health, where they randomized people to different types of health insurance plans. Uh, all the way from a, a super high deductible, effectively no insurance plan to first dollar coverage plan. And they found that, they found like a 0.1 Snellen line change in, in your vision acuity. That's a handful of people got glasses, actually. That's 0.1 of a line, you know, on those, those eye charts. 
better. So, and that was it. And it wasn't through lack of trying, because those guys, those folks worked hard on that uh, and looked for everything. Uh, more recently, if you say, well, that was the 70s, you know, that was, there was disco music and bell-bottom trousers back then. So, so let's, you know, what about more recent evidence? Oregon Health Insurance Experiment, the best and brightest from Harvard and MIT and associated places, uh, used an experimental lottery system that happened in the Oregon Medicaid uh, 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 system. And, and the only thing they found was that people were less depressed. But they were less depressed because they didn't have the cost of health care to worry about. And that, that actually makes, I'd be less depressed if I got free health insurance and I didn't have to pay any co-payments. Uh, well, I'd still be an economist, so I'd probably still be depressed about things. But, but nevertheless, um, th th that's, as it, that's kind of as it should be because, again, insurance is fundamentally a financial contract. It's not something that's going to make you healthy. Uh, uh, it, 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 will prov it will indemnify you against the uh, 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 threats of, of catastrophic health care spending, but, but that's it. And that's good. Okay, but let's not imbue it with too much more than that, because that's what its fundamental purpose is. So, okay, so I, uh, I'm going, to, I'm out of time, so I, I just want to say I really am glad to be here. Uh, this has been really, uh, again, a great paper. I've enjoyed reading it. Uh, I look forward to further interaction with, uh, with you all and, and with Wendy. Uh, thanks very much. Hi, so I'm Sherry Westerfield. Is Previously announced, I was the, uh, the chief actuary at Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield in upstate New York. Uh, but yes, I live in Chicago. Uh, so, you know, there's all these professors here, and it's like, okay, so why would anybody bring an actuary to here? So uh, I guess I'm, I'm here to sort of bring down the a little bit more in the what happens in the actual insurance markets and what, what do we see from our perspective. And I do agree a lot with Wendy's uh, uh, paper on, again, the that the majority of the uninsured today are generally younger adults. And I do believe that cost is the real reason. There might be some of those other, um, you know, inertia bias and uh, the complexity could be factoring in, but, but by and large, you know, I do see the cost is the, the main driver. And one of the ways we see that is, um, coverage take up has been going down or insured Uninsured rates have been going up, as Wendy mentioned, and there's there's definitely as as the ACA went into place and the rates have had to have been sort of adjusted year to year to, to find that where does the actual rate meet the the market average? Because then when you're when you're pricing on a community rated basis, you kind of have to price for the pool that is covered. Back again, that if we can get healthier group of people covered, that would help uh, bring. Not, maybe not bring prices down, because there, there's other drivers pushing it up, obviously the actual cost of care and new drugs and things, but it will certainly take pressure off of the increases in, in the premiums. So as we saw over the last several years, the prices become more uh, aligned with the actual population being covered. We've seen the actual uh, lapses increase over the years. So. Uh, by and large, I do believe cost is the main driver. And uh, I also agree with Wendy that it's probably a mix of people who truly cannot afford it and those who just don't see the value proposition in spending what could be and likely be several hundred dollars a month for something that they don't think they'll get anything back from. So I do believe it's both of those. Uh, she mentioned that we, we talked a little bit previously and... Um, you know, again, I explained that today, the individual market is really sort of a transitional market, or even you might even refer to a market of last resort. People, you know, if they're eligible for Medicare or Medicaid or employer coverage, they're obviously going to take those first before they go to the individual market. Uh, she did mention, though, too, that that could be changing a little bit much with the changing um, employment dynamics, where more and more of these younger people are being independent contractors and the... Um, individual market may be their, their really their only source of potential coverage. So um, 
with that said, I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of her uh, proposed uh, options in the paper and, uh, and give some of my thoughts on them. Um, the the long-term policies, again, I think because of the short-term nature of, of the market, that, that was one of the, um, probably the biggest hurdle, uh, unless that really does change in the near future. The other thing I see that from a, from a health plan perspective is that, is that she also said that if, if people become, you know, to, to avoid sort of the real penalties of people getting coverage elsewhere, whether they get employment or other coverage, that they could um, basically uh, be exempt from the exit penalty. But that seems like then all that benefit is lost. And I'm thinking that's probably going to happen a lot over certainly a 10-year period, you know, maybe five or three years, which she also discussed, you know, could be different. But in, those, in the really long term, I'm guessing that's going to override most of the uh, initial benefit. Um, and the, uh, conceptually though, I mean, I think the idea is that having lower rates for younger people to attract them in. Well, again, as an actuary, first thing I would say, well, that's the same as having a steeper age rating curve. So instead of having three to one rating, why not go to four to one? Um, again, it does take a law change, but four to one actually is closer to the actual underlying cost. Um, on an age basis, not counting specifically health status, which you still would not rate for, but uh, in a, what we consider modified community, community rating world, where you can rate somewhat on age, if you had a little steeper of an age curve, so you bring in, a, you basically would essentially achieve the same thing. You would have lower rates for younger people earlier, and those rates would increase a little bit more every year until you got to the um, to the age 64 rate, which is the max before people become Medicare eligible. So it seems like you'd almost achieve the same thing, and it might be actually a simpler option. The return of premium idea, uh, again, it's, it's something that is used uh, today, but in different contexts, life insurance, where the, um, the claim rates obviously are much lower than health insurance and uh, much easier to do longer term, um, oftentimes that money is then invested and it's the in investment income that then supports the, uh, the return of the premium. H much harder to do in health insurance. Again, you're not going to probably have as long of a term, first of all. And again, you don't want to totally um, disincentivize any claims. You want people to get their preventive, whatever else they, uh, they really need. So the devil's definitely in the details, how much you would return. And um, the example of a 20% surcharge for 80% return, I can, without having to do any of the numbers, I pretty much tell you that that's not really going to work. Um, it would have to be a much smaller return and probably a higher surcharge, probably more in the 30 to 40%, and probably you probably could return 40, 50% maybe. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of numbers work that has to go behind that. But um, in some of the other types of insurance today that do such um, types of return of premium. Uh, I do know that their, you know, their loads could be anywhere from 60 to 100% and a 20-year uh, policy with no claims before it's returned. So just to give you a, a comparable sense of what, what goes on in the market today. Um, the generosity framework one, I'm not even going to touch. I am an actuary. I am not, no idea on that one. So, um, but I will go to auto enrollment. This is something, again, that comes up a lot. Uh, it's, it's a great concept. I actually like the idea because I do think part of what's holding some people back is uh, really knowing uh, what is out there, what their, what their options are, what the subsidies might bring them. And so a way of getting, getting that to them in a way that makes it easier for them might help. Uh, but I still struggle with the how do you identify people, and then how do you get them to actually pay? So I think there's still some uh, practical hurdles, but I think from a concept, um, being able to help people truly navigate the market and understand their options, I think could be beneficial. Uh, a couple items that she didn't mention that, again, are not necessarily new, but I think just what I truly think, again, is getting to the cost. The, the, um, to me, that's still the biggest barrier. Um, there, you know, there are some 
complexity issues, I agree. And I'll just throw out that in New York State, we have standardized plans to make it simple for consumers to just pick the standardized plan. Almost nobody buys the standardized plan, so it's just an example. But uh, very little, everybody has to offer them, and nobody buys them. So um, I don't know what that, if that tells you anything. It's just an example. But one thing I do think could work is enhancing the tax credits. Um, you know, they're, they are structured up to a 400% of the federal poverty level. But if you really look at how they work, being at 300 or higher, you really aren't getting much of a value. And for people, 300 is only, what, $36,000 a year. That's not much to be um, buying uh, um, individual market coverage with. So I think if you can truly and help out uh, a little bit more those people in those middle income ranges, uh, I think targeting the affordability would really be helpful there. And I think, you know, and they go up to 400%. Again, though, there's not much of a benefit at 400. E even that's, you know, under $50,000 a year, still not uh, a level of income that maybe could really support uh, health insurance um, without giving up, as Wendy was saying, some of the you know, sort of daily or um, necessities. But it also would help target that value proposition. You know, some of these, um, you know, higher income individuals may be able to afford it, but don't, again, don't see the value in affording it, in buying it. And so maybe a little more in the subsidy range could help in that aspect. Uh, obviously, that does require law changes and everything too, but um, uh, that could be helpful. Probably the easiest one to do is because it, there's already a spot in the law for it under the 1332 waivers is, is the uh, insurance programs. Uh, a lot of states are doing these now, reinsurance, and it, it basically brings down the cost for everybody by paying the insurers directly for some of the larger claims. So you essentially take those claims out of the pool when you calculate the premiums are based on the re what's remaining in the pool. So lower premiums can entice the healthier people to join, which then also can further reduce the premiums. Um, it also has, it also revert, helps re reduce the amount of tax credits too. The lower the premiums, the lower the tax credits are as well. So these are going on uh, at the state level, though I think it works better at a, at a federal level because of pooling. Because, you know, especially these really large claims, you really want to take them out of the pool across all states. And so, um, you know, from a pure actuarial standpoint, doing it at a federal level will provide your smoothest uh, adjustments to your, to, your, um, to your claims pool. Um, they can, because these larger claims can obviously fluctuate a lot, and then in turn you might have premiums fluctuating if you can't uh, absorb all of them on a consistent basis. So that's um, just some thoughts that I had on what uh, I see from the markets today. Thanks. Well, thank you all. I thank you for inviting me, but I probably invited myself, so it would be a little stra straining cr credibility on that point. Um, sometimes when I uh, talk about this issue, uh, I adapt uh, Samuel Johnson in a similar way that, uh, like Republicans trying to uh, take on health policy reform, you're not surprised uh, that it's not done well, but that it's attempted at all. So too, Wendy's exploring uh, private law, behaviorally adjusted alternatives to the individual mandate. Now, uh, David referred to my lack of Illinois credentials. I did uh, spend the, uh, the shortest spring I ever had uh, in May of 1974 as a summer law associate at a law firm uh, in Chicago. Um, and so in keeping with uh, the themes here, we've got uh, Chicago Justice. Uh, David went to medical school at UC, Chicago Medicine, Chicago Economics, and now Chicago Improv, because the partners there were laughing at the end of the summer at the work I had done. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, to update the, uh, the classic words of mythical ex-Met baseball player 
Oh, excuse me, that's on the title there. Uh, Chico Escuela. Uh, the individual mandate been very, very good to me. Uh, I'm a little, have some pent up supply here. I've been teaching millennials in law school. I can't use my pop cultural references beyond a decade or two, so I've got an oversupply of unused material, and you're going to get it today. Um, <clears throat> The first Republican uh, sponsored incarnation of the individual mandate, uh, courtesy of our friends in the early 1990s at the Heritage Foundation, pretty, got my, pretty much got me on the health policy map with the first full fledged uh, think tank paper opposing it. Um, and after that debacle uh, tied to the primary failure of the Clinton plan, most Republicans and old conservatives buried the mandate idea for more than a decade. By the way, I learned from David a long time ago, if you don't cite yourself, other people won't cite you as frequently as you want to. So I follow in that path. Uh, Obamacare uh, certainly uh, revived the individual mandate as an actual part of the ACA, which turned out to be good for book sales uh, as the most unpopular element of that law. Um, after the mandate's enactment, but before its uh, initial implementation nationwide, there were plenty of speaking opportunities uh, to point out that a few Republicans uh, had uh, gone astray uh, from the main herd. Now, we rolled ahead to the Supreme Court's consideration of whether the individual mandate was unconstitutional and might, might take down the rest of the law with it. Uh, so don't let me... Uh, count the ways again for how the mandate was flawed. I've been there and done that uh, many times before. And even if you wanted it to work in theory, it really didn't accomplish much in practice other than to annoy too many people. So the individual mandate story is essentially like many other past and present health policy reforms. Uh, seemed like a good idea at the time before we went in the drink. Uh, let me get to kind of a couple of quick conclusions, then we'll go on to kind of uh, Wendy's paper in particular. Uh, the bottom line is uh, that the mandate deserved the least credit and not a lot for the coverage expansion. It was primarily due to the generosity of subsidies and how they were targeted and the Medicaid expansion, which didn't need a mandate to throw people into it, and many states were happy to do that with federal money. Um, in U.S. politics, unlike European politics, we need to remember that we are neither willing to be sufficiently coercive or sufficiently generous to move as close as we imagine we can get to, to universal coverage. There are ceilings uh, on both of those efforts, which then create floors on how much we can accomplish uh, through those existing tools. The bigger problem is our choice of assumptions and givens. You let me make my assumptions and givens, I can achieve a lot of things. But until we re-examine what those assumptions are and change them, we're going to be left to choose only among the least worst of several inadequate and disappointing solutions. Um, and you can do on the one hand and on the other hand, but it turns out that most of those one hand and other hand exercises, at least as I look through the paper, end up always saying the intervention hand some is able to reach a little bit deeper than other things. Now, one of the uh, traditionally lazier defenses of the individual mandate is that it's necessary to ensure uh, balanced risk pools for health insurance. The argument goes that uh, left to their own risk segmenting uh, preferences, insurers and premium paying customers would prefer to swim in healthier risk pools together uh, at the country club. Um, on the other hand, higher risk people are at best transferred to separate pools to reduce premiums at the club pool, or the other alternative is to try to throw younger and healthier people in the individual market into a single pool, whether they like it or not. Uh, from a health policy planner's standpoint, Leaving choices to individuals about where, how, or how much they want to purchase health insurance just complicates more important political goals, even if they can't quite pull off more universal commands. Health insurers really just want to stay in business and move more product. Uh, as one uh, insurance executive told me about a decade ago, the saying used to be, uh, we'll sell whatever dog food the dogs will eat. Uh, the problem is that if the younger and healthy pups aren't hungry, uh, well, a mandate could be better for sales, or at least you need to talk to the, the pup's owner, which is the employer-based system. Uh, the deeper problem, of course, could be best explained in the updated words of uh, former New York City mayoral candidate Jimmy McMillan, 
But offering more attractive products that cost less and provide more value, well, that is uh, apparently just too much harder. So as much as there's background rhetoric and uh, mood music about ensuring that everyone has guaranteed assurance of valuable health care services and better health, the mandate's core purpose really is financial. Getting someone, preferably younger, healthier, and less expensive to pay more, if not a lot more, in insurance premiums to cross-subsidize other people who cost too much to insure and can't or won't pay the freight. So the mandate is sort of the 21st century version of a draft for the health insurance pools that insurers, policymakers, and CBO budget scores want but can't achieve without a stronger push. Of course, it uh, turns out that the often Im repeated imagery of the three-legged stool uh, needed to support the ACA, for which one, one leg was the regulation of benefits and, and rating rules, uh, the other was income-based subsidies, and the third was the individual mandate. It ran into some air turbulence, uh, and several of the legs got very wobbly and shortened, uh, if not completely sawed off. But even if the stool was flattened into too much more of a thin seat cushion of silver-loaded tax subsidies, they made an excellent flotation device for insurers still staying afloat in troubled insurance exchange marketplaces. So the search, though, does somehow continue uh, that for something that can work like the mandate promised to, but did not appear in the wild. Uh, again, that search continues on. Hence, a updated resort to the magic of behavioral economics for a really groovy solution to enrollment and coverage problems. Now, this is a somewhat less direct echo of earlier, more stimulus response experiments uh, in getting subjects to peck the right keys. Here we go. I'm sorry. I got to go back there. Uh, to peck the right keys and gain valuable rewards, although you often can get college students in psych labs to do things they might resist in the real world. Uh, the promise or premise of nudge based behavioral economics paternalism is that this won't hurt a bit, except when push comes to shove. Now, there are quite a few insights from the behavioral economics literature though not always applied in the right places, mostly about systemic decision-making biases. We've got a roster of them, optimism bias, illusion of control bias, the anecdotal fallacy, a choice overload in complexity, hyperbolic discounting, bounded irrationality. These echo with my experience. I've been on Capitol Hill. You see it all the time. You can observe a whole lot just by watching. That's the flip side of behavioral economics of public choice. And of course, we have the greatest one of all, status quo bias in health policy, where no matter what failed in the past, we'll just add some more layers on top of the hull and just say, well, we'll patch it with some other work to work around what we did before. Now, let's talk about solutions. And it's always good to search for solutions, and I uh, I appreciate the heroic efforts uh, to try to come up with some things which will make things other than what they are. Uh, we could start with the uh, low intro rates. It has been tried before, uh, not only in, uh, uh, well, real estate works pretty well, but we actually have done this in public programs. We say nothing down a lot of times. We just don't fund our entitlements, or we underfund them, or we say that, well, there's some rate restrictions which will make it seem cheaper. So we've tried the low intro rates, and they work for a period of time until eventually you have to pay the balloon note, although we're stretching that out pretty far. Um, <clears throat> I like the idea of longer-term contracts. There are just a lot of mechanical issues with making them come about. Some that aren't thought about is if you're going to have the exit penalties, you've got to think about what are going to be the switching rules if you want to have more than one choice one time, uh, as has been the problem with kind of the uh, guaranteed renewability. So you've got to have switching and settlement rules, which are more complicated unless you then have to absorb some degree of bounded uh, choice beyond that process. Um, my one pointed quibble uh, with uh, Wendy's uh, analysis of alternatives to the individual mandate involves her rather casual discard of the continuous coverage uh, HIPAA extension approach. Of course, the Republican lawmakers trying to advance it didn't understand it, didn't know how to explain it, and therefore didn't know how to sell it. But the missing ingredient was how it could interact 
with sufficiently funded high-risk pool coverage protection, hard to make that invisible risk pool protection if you want to actually have the incentive effects of it. So they probably have to be visible and they have to actually be paid for. But it would close the loop on the eventual access to mainstream market coverage pr uh, protected uh, against pre-existing condition limits because the enrollees in the high-risk pools would re-qualify after they'd been in the pool for 18 months. So you basically had the equivalent of folks going into the hockey penalty box for a period of time. They got dinged, but they got to get back out on the arena uh, having re-qualified. And it's a way to provide a bit of a disincentive to not be covered, but not uh, the one all the way. And so that's what's so understood. So where are we left with all this? Well, there are a lot of more exotic alternatives which we're not able to entertain politically. So the main alternative until we're really ready to consider alternatives is it's going to take a lot of money, and we're going to have to make it rain. Uh, and therefore, I suggest we're going to need the helicopters of the Federal Reserve. We're working on it already. Thank you very much. All right, so we have an absolute scarcity of seats there, so I get to stand. Um, and we've got uh, just over half an hour left, so what we're going to do is spend probably 15 minutes or so, maybe a little less with the panelists talking amongst themselves and then open it up so we'll have 15 to 20 minutes uh, for conversation more broadly. I do want to say optimism bias is what gets me out of bed in the morning, so um, I think we should have a little more love for some of these um, behavioral biases. Um, and even if we don't like them, the, the, and even if we think that at least some of them are primarily found among uh, undergraduates at elite schools that happen to have enrolled in psych classes, and so they're the guinea pigs, um, you know, the, you, you should worry about the generalizability of the phenomena and offsetting institutions and all of those things. Um, you know, it, to the extent it helps us predict more effectively how people will behave, we should not be hostile to them, but we should be simultaneously conscious of their limits. So with that, um, I have my own set of questions if we run out of them, but uh, let me just start by asking Wendy if she'd like to respond to anything that she's heard from the panel. Yeah, I mean, so I, I appreciate everybody's comments. I, you know, I'm, the goal here is to move the conversation forward, so I hope that we're doing that. Um, just sort of a blanket way of addressing the uh, sort of criticisms of the way the Affordable Care Act is set up. I'm trying to be explicit in this paper kind of not to make it a defense of the Affordable Care Act or to you know, argue that the Affordable Care Act was a bad idea. I just want to take where we're currently at and try to work within the confines of, of the regime. And actually, I think that some of the points that, that Tony made so humorously, <laughs> I will note, um, support the reasons why we need to have some of these interventions. So the fact that people can wait until they are sick to purchase insurance, I mean, that's why we have risk pools that have a lot of sick people and not a lot of healthy people. So I think part of the goal of the conversation is to figure out how do we address that consequence of now having an affordable care act without an individual mandate, sort of underpowered to try to get healthy people into the risk pools. Um, you know, I think, and I'll just take on one other thing. So, so uh, the criticism about how I address the continuous coverage option. So I didn't talk about this today, but in the paper, what I say is that um, not many alternatives to the individual mandate have been discussed on the policy stage. One of them was this continuous coverage idea, which was relatively short-lived. And I will say that I think the major problem with the continuous coverage uh, idea is that you are penalizing people for the decision to re-enroll in insurance. So I think that that could have unintended consequences. Because uh, what you really want is if somebody has had a lapse in insurance, you, know, you want them to fix that as soon as possible. You want to prompt them to enroll in an insurance policy. And if you now make it 30% more expensive for them to um, re-up their insurance, I think that that's problematic. Although I take the point that hopefully it has the effect of deterring them from lapsing in the first place. Um, but I think I'm going to sort of open it up for other comments and questions before I do too much more. Um, so, well, let me, let me then start with a, a specific question and that we can perhaps kick around. So how, if, if you think of this, um, Sherry said, I think quite explicitly, that this is both mostly about the cost. Tom said it, that the, the rent is too damn high. Sherry said the, the cost is what's driving the reluctance to enroll. Um, but you've written an entire paper that says, yeah, it's cost, but I've also got all of these behavioral economics explanations as well. So uh, relative shares, how much of this is driven off of behavioral economics versus 
neoclassical economics. And if it's mostly neoclassical, shouldn't you be writing about how we should get the cost of health care down, which would get the cost of insurance down, rather than coming up with clever stratagems to get people to pay for overpriced health insurance because health care is overpriced? Yeah, I mean, by the way, I think that is absolutely still a valuable enterprise. And, and I hope to write about that. And I hope lots of other people are writing about how do we get the cost of insurance down which probably has a lot more to do with um, hospital prices and provider prices than um, just the, this narrow look at the premium issue. Um, but the, the prior part of the question was, I forget. Relative shares. Oh, relative shares, right. We don't know, right? I mean, this is why we need to be doing more experimentation. We need to be doing more surveying. Um, I, you know, the study that, that Chris and I did on this very short-term basis, relatively small sample size, but we were surprised to see that the increased subsidy, at least in our you know, little slice of, of data here, didn't move people, right? You would have thought if you throw $500 more at people that that would make them more likely to buy insurance than our base case or than some of these other no cost. I mean, the generosity frame other than some marketing is really a no cost solution. And that's not what we found. So you know, maybe future studies will prove us wrong and that's why we need to keep pressing on these issues, but I don't think it's entirely clear that just throwing more subsidies at this is going to be the answer. I also, and maybe I'll ask Tony to weigh in on this, because most of the economists that I've talked to, talk to about this additional subsidy idea have told me that it's quite inefficient to actually offer additional subsidies because you're going to be, um, it will ultimately lead to increased demand over what would be efficient. So. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that just the throwing more money at it is the way to address it without considering some of these other options. So that sounds like all behavioral economics and no neoclassical economics. No, that I, <laughs> that's why I set it up as there are more, that there's many reasons that people are not buying insurance. And I think we need to consider what those reasons are. I also think that we need to have some, some targeting here, right? If we can identify the people who aren't signing up for insurance because it's too costly, we could offer them a different solution than the people who aren't signing up for insurance because they're overly optimistic and think that they're not going to use um, their policy and that they're just throwing away their premiums. So I think that that's part of the goal here is to do some segmenting. We're really good at market research now, and we're really good at um, offering the, the right products to the right people. Maybe we need to do more of that with health insurance. And Sherry, how about to our uh, Illinois references, all quotes are ultimately attributed to Lincoln, whether they're apocryphal or not. And he used to say, you can fool some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time. And behavioral economics hopes to fool enough of the people often enough to make it pay for more than it seems it's worth. I think that's actually P.T. Barnum, but okay. <laughs> um, so Sherry, you're in the business, right? And I mean, you do you think hiring some more market researchers will let you segment the market in ways that will let you achieve those goals? Um, again, I'm an actuary, so no, I don't think in those terms. But I'm sure our marketing people would say, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. But um, uh, I, I just think that it's um, it, it, there is a value decision being made. For those people who are actually looking into it, I think there is a portion of the segment or the population, and, and I don't really know how big, that's not even trying. Now, that may be, I think, where Wendy's kind of getting at is like, why are those people not even interested to find out enough information? I, there probably is that group. Um, but I think, by and far, it is a value question for most people. Do I spend my money on this or? You know, do I get a new iPhone or something? I don't, you know, some of those trade-offs are what people are, are addressing. Tony, you're an economist. You deal with trade-offs. <laughs> That's right. It's on my business card. Um, no, I, I, I mean, I, 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 think, I, I think it's, you know, I guess, as I said in my earlier comments, you know, it's, um, you know, unless you start to deviate from, you um, Community-rated policies. I mean, because um, because what we're talking about here is trying, you know, what Sherry's saying and and, and what Wendy, you know, is is sort of allowing for is that well, you know, people don't, you know, it's the price, you know, and people don't see, um, you know, and you and you just can't. It's really hard to force somebody to buy something that they don't think is a good value. I mean, um, you know, mandates or not, uh, and so. Um, you know, so how do you how do you solve that? Well, I mean, make it cheaper. I mean, so then how do you make it cheaper? Well, then you have to start deviating from 
uh, what the law says. And so, um, you know, that, that's, so you either have to change the law or, or do, or I don't know, or go outside the law, I don't know. But, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I do think there's this fundamental issue here of, of, of the, um, you know, the sort of uh, non-insurable expenses being brought in and then expecting other people um, to, to, to subsidize them. Um, and, uh, and, and buy the policies, the, the, again, in, in the inflated premium policies by virtue of the, uh, the pre-existing condition. So I was always a little more sanguine about, um, uh, about properly uh, funded high risk pools or other mechanisms that could uh, deal with those. I mean, because again, you don't want to, we're, we're a compassionate society. We, we don't want to throw people out, out to the wolves. Uh, so we deal with, but, but deal, don't try to ram it. Don't try to ram the solution to that problem through the insurance market and thereby prevent the insurance market from working uh, like a market should. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, I, I think all of what we're talking about here are these elaborate kind of Rube Goldberg-esque uh, Schemes that are, are 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 trying to solve this fundamental incompatibility that's happening uh, that that was indeed foisted upon the market, um, and and so you know redirecting subsidies um, towards the uh, those who are are, are truly facing uh, uh, you know genuine health care problems uh, for which they cannot get an affordable policy, uh, you know always struck me. As as a uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of details there to work out, you know, because you, you, there's still adverse selection issues and, and all of that, and then insurer potential insurer behavior, uh, untoward behavior uh, to try to pitch people into the uh, high rich. So so there's there's it's not like it's an easy look. If this was easy, we would have, we would have licked this problem already. So um, so yeah, it, it's definitely complicated. But I, I was always a little more. Uh, uh, optimistic about about those types of approaches. I mean, that that leads us outside of what the Affordable Care Act is, as Wendy That's said. She we had the and, and, and Care Act, right? well, I, on, I I said properly funded uh, high risk pools. I don't think that they were ever funded ser in a serious way because again, it turns out that there's a lot of those pre existing conditions, and, and maybe that becomes a transitional problem uh, as you move towards something more universal. I'm intrigued by you know def defaulting people in, though there are potentially lots of problems with that. Um, reinsurance, it's, it sounds great on paper, but then I always say, well, why, why, wouldn't, uh, why wouldn't Anthem buy, be buying this? Why aren't the companies buying this if it was just basically free money? I, I could just, else pays for it. Well, they, then they love it. Yeah, if somebody else is paying for the reinsurance, sure, that's great. Um, and so, uh, but again, I, you know, uh, firms are, are fully capable of buying their own reinsurance and presumably then, you know, reducing premiums and getting more customers. Why Except isn't that, that happening? That reins right, that reinsurance isn't free, it's, of it's course. Not free. So the cost of that has to go back into the premium. So that's why it's not helping. You have to get the claims out of the pool entirely yeah. for it to actually help. Chris, let me bring you into this conversation. Chris, I uh, omitted from my introduction, uh, has edited a book entitled Nudging Health, Behavioral Economics and Health Law, um, where uh, there was a conference at Harvard that included a bunch of presentations on these sets of issues. So can you sort of bring in from that book and also from your research something on these sets of issues? Sure. Um, um, you know, I think it is right to say that behavioral economics or nudging uh, generally is, is looking for a marginal behavior change. We're looking for whether a different way of framing something or a different way of constructing it can, can change um, a certain number of people to do what the policy is, is hoping they'll do. And, and here what we're trying to do, um, uh, because we have not adopted a, a fulsome uh, tax and subsidy structure, um, we're trying to use the, the premium um, uh, from healthy, relatively wealthy people uh, as, as the behavioral change. We're trying to get them to pay that premium even if it wouldn't strictly be rational to do so. And so, you know, we, I think one of the, the sort of ships passing in the night issues of, of this panel is that we're trying to approach the questions from a notion of rational behavior. Um, but ultimately, these questions of subsidies um, to the extent they're paid through taxes is a, a not is not justifiable in a simple rational actor individual donation idea. The very idea of a tax is to is to 
force someone to pay um, in, a, in a way that they would otherwise probably prefer not to. So it's, it's interesting to me as we think about a generosity frame, for example, is, is, is an individualist notion of what Europe would call a, solidar a solidarity frame that we're going to you know, chip in together through taxes. The generosity frame says, well, let's see if you individually want to chip in, which then creates a, switching back to neoclassical economics, creates a, um, uh, a collective action problem, a free rider problem, if you have some people chipping in and others not. Um, so, so I think, uh, I hope the comment has illustrated, you know, we're really working, you know, between classical economics, trying to find a behavioral margin when really the larger question, I think, is a distributional question, is about who we want to get to pay for what. <laughs> Which is what Washington is always about. Um, so actually, let me focus on the generosity framing for a minute. So Wendy, you said, you know, part of the challenge in a generosity framing is, um, Insurance companies are above cable companies, but not so much uh, in terms of the you know high popular regard uh, and trust. Uh, although in practice we repose huge amounts of money with them, and you know uh, there's a regulatory framework, we can leave all of that aside. Um, but I guess the question is, you suggest well maybe we should start an insurance company that will be more trustworthy, right? And I guess my question to you was well what about the co-ops? that got started in the exchanges, and I suspect many of the people at co-ops are obviously consumer-owned. They have a, a different set of incentives um, than even a nonprofit enterprise. Um, and I think most they of the people so in the room probably know something about the um, dismal success rate uh, in many of the states. So uh, do you, you expect you'll get better people to run your generous insurance Company, I, mean, I think co -op? We, we might be talking about apples and oranges. I don't know that the reasons that the co-ops failed would be the same hurdles that uh, a new insurance entrant that has this different framing would face. Um, you know, but to the extent that there is an advantage to being a big player in an already consolidated market, Chris and I were actually talking about, you know, well, what if it's a subsidiary of one of the big companies that's like separately branded um, and sort of comes out with this pitch as their... Uh, their way to attract new insureds. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not so moved that the co-op failure means that there can never be any new entrant into this market. I think that would be um, kind of a, de a depressing way to look at it. Um, and I, I'm, I'm filling Tony's role. <laughs> um, he's appreciative, I'm sure. Um, so I, I wouldn't shut it down just for that reason. But you know, I'm cautious about this. Like this is. It was kind of a crazy idea when I first started writing this paper. And to be honest, what happened was I went to go present a really early stage version of this paper at Mississippi College. And I sort of thought that the students that I was presenting this to, who were kind of my target population, they were you know, young, many of them were just hitting 26 and were going to have to be in this market. And I sort of thought they would laugh me out of the room. It's a relatively you know, conservative group of students. And I was surprised at how many of them thought it was a good idea. So I mean, I was almost not even going to put it in the paper until I went and presented it at, at, this, at the Mississippi College School of Law. So um, I guess I'm still feeling it out. I'm not sure how optimistic we should be, but I think it's worth exploring. Chris, you have a can, I, can I just add? You know, uh, I thought you were also going to invoke the the experience of these religious uh, healthcare sharing organizations, um, where various religious groups agree to cover each other, um, and they're more or less formal, and whether they're actually insurance under the law, and whether they should count for, whether they satisfy the individual mandate, it was a whole other realm of questions. Um, um, but, but, but I, and so they're problematic also in different ways for whether they actually work. But I'm illustrate. I want to bring them up here because there's other variations on the generosity frame that, that could be worth exploring empirically. So it could be, you know, we people of religious type X are going to join this insurance company for other people like us. Um, whatever, you know, you could have the, the Boy Scouts alumni or the, you know, um, university alumni club or whatever the group is, you could leverage a narrower notion than universal generosity. Um, and so a different version of that would also be patriotism. You could leverage like, you know, the way we sold war bonds or the way we got people to recycle their rags during World War II was, you know, in fact, we want you to contribute. So you could try to leverage that sort of notion too. It's not generosity, but maybe your responsibility. 
Um, and so these are all different ways of, of leveraging this, again, non-rational <laughs> motivations, whatever ones you may have, let's find them and, and manipulate you. Tom? We do exercise a generosity frame often in our modern politics. It said we're generous with other people's money. They'll pay for it. The rich will pay for it. There's lots of generosity attributed to other people, just not to ourselves. Um, so that actually takes us to, we've got about 15 minutes left. So let's see if we have some questions. Let me just clarify. Questions or brief comments, but not speeches. And on the topic that we're considering here, rather than the broader universe. No, I'm focusing to the audience in general. Uh, um, I think we do have a microphone coming around. So I'm about to call on you, but I'm just giving general comments for everyone. So please. Well, I have four questions. So it might add up to a small speech. And I've been doing health policy for 30 years, and Tom and Joe have been putting up with me for that long. I've been doing inequality policy basically for five years and looking out after the lower folks, trying to include them, people at the bottom of the heap. First question I have is, you talk about private, I've, the second meeting I've been to in a couple of weeks where they talk about private law remedies. The, the other people at Brookings were talking about, it included regulatory action, but here it just seems to include anything the government's not doing that's legal. So it would be voluntary actions in the market. Is this just a way to get a lawyer into the conversation? But anyhow, so the second thing, you asked for other research, right? Um, and I'm really glad, I thought Sherry did a wonderful job because I've interviewed, I've done a lot of research on the markets. But you, uh, not just the actuaries, because they're very logical, but the inter interview the insurance companies, the marketing guys, interview the regulators, highly regulated industry. It's a very cutthroat industry in the individual market. And if, if anybody's nice, they're going to get the, you know, the, the, the way they, they are market, they're going to get the, the $100,000 therapy or the, you know, the million dollar therapy now. So. <laughs> Being nice is not really possible unless they're a monopoly, and then they charge a lot anyhow. So that's, um, in terms of behavioral economics, I think the, the, the rich field is, is look at the tax code and what that does to employer behavior and offering coverage and how the wealthiest employees at the wealthiest firm drive up the price because it's an open-ended tax break for the higher, that's where the behavioral economics plays. As it does with the, you know, the, the cutthroat behavioral economics in the, in the insurance market. So that's where you, I mean, I think it's not the cute little stuff, but it's behavioral economics. And finally, I think I'm a cost guy. So like where I live, and my kids, one of them is a blue collar, one of them is a white collar. In, in, in Northern Virginia, um, somebody working in a nursing home, married to somebody in a warehouse, is making $40,000, $45,000 as a couple. At Kaiser, which is the cheapest option, on the exchange, that's going to be about 20 grand, maybe 15 to 20 grand. That's half of their income. How does a small employer, it's money. The top of the market's driven up the price to where they can't afford it. I mean, you can wiggle, waggle, shine a little whatever in trying to sell them this. It, it's, there's a huge disconnect. So anyhow, that's my question, four questions. Cost, is it really cost? What about private law? Is this, you can do anything you want. Um, in these areas of exploration of, of behavioral economics. So I'm, I'm sorry, it was a speech, but I got away with it. <laughs> it was actually four questions. So Wendy, why don't you pick up whichever yeah. one of those you'd like? I mean, the private law question is fair. It's a proxy of a term, right? I'm really trying to look at what can we do within the confines of the current legal regime. You know, and some of these do require some sort of small, what I view as relatively small changes to the law. Um, to support them, but I want to know what we can do under the current regime. Um, and then I, I guess I'll just take the last point about the, the cost being prohibited for people who are making $45,000 a year as a couple. I mean, the subsidies should make it so that uh, those people are not paying half of their income, and that's the way that they're calculated, right? They still fall um, within the, the subsidies, uh, but you're talking about right at the end, right? Right when you get over 400% of the federal poverty level. That is problematic because those are not necessarily wealthy people. Those are people for whom health care is expensive. So that's why we're, we're testing to see if you give those people subsidies, does it make a big difference? And I just I think that's an open question. I think that's something we need to experiment more with. Other members of the panel want to speak to any of the questions? Well, private law should mean contracts. And if public law doesn't prohibit voluntary contracts from finding willing buyers and willing sellers, you might have more interesting, creative arrangements. 
but because the public law says you can only make certain agreements for certain reasons because we have overriding roles, the bounds of what you can do through private action and private law is limited. You're trying workarounds, and in some cases trying to be super clever, in other cases trying to find loopholes, or in other cases petitioning for waivers around the law you just created to tie your hands. Other questions from the audience, Carr? Thank you. Um, well, I'm Tara Sklar, also with the University of Arizona College of Law, and I think it's a very provocative, interesting paper, and I enjoyed all the comments from the panel as well. And um, my questions regard around the variations in framing, and I was wondering if you've given much thought to why people save for retirement in relation to the long-term care policies, uh, long-term long-term insurance policies, because it reminds me of the long-term care issues as well, like why people opt not to buy long-term care insurance. And um, one thing that might come up is if you, in addition to the vignette, could have um, older age renderings of a person when they're answering a question of themselves, they could upload a photo and see if that could change the likelihood of them wanting to buy a long-term policy. Um, something like that, we can play with it more, where they can put themselves more in the future and try to I guess have less optimism bias. <laughs> and, um, and the other thought I had was when you were talking about the rising uninsured, how that's probably a very not equally felt across the demographics. And um, from what I've been reading, it's much higher felt among Hispanic groups in particular, and how to frame things so that you could really try to address some of those cultural issues, whether it's with the generosity framing or religious framing or cultural framing, how to kind of get to that group where they really are the highest group dropping out right now. Th thank you. So I'm going to let you personally answer this too, but can I just, I, I would just say we need to do all of that, right? We need to do a lot more testing of these concepts. We need to segment this in all sorts of different ways. This was like a very early pilot study that we were trying to just get some data out for purposes of today, but I think we also want to test different frames, not just generosity. Um, so I think that those are all really good ideas. Um, with the, the age suggestion, I'm not sure I totally followed because we were, you're asking the same person to picture themselves being older and to see if it would change what their, they think their own decisions would be. Right, so there was a study at NYU yeah. that did this, they replicated it, where it changes behaviors and um, what you would say when you, when you sorry, what you would say when, you, um, how much of your savings you'd want to put towards your future retirement. Um, they. Um, split the group so that the experimental group had a rendering of themselves, you know, 40, 30, whatever their age is, 20 years right. older than where they are now, and a group that didn't see an older rendering of themselves, and that impacted how they responded oh, to the I survey. Oh, you're saying. Yeah. Okay, so it made it more concrete for them. To, right, like a visual. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that per se, but if you're already sort of doing an online digital experiment anyway, have them upload a photo and see if that could affect. So their... riffing off that idea, there's all sorts of interesting potential um, uh, manipulations that could be done around uh, deep fake videos. Are you familiar with this idea that you can like put a celebrity's face on someone else's body, having them do some horrible thing or some great thing? Well, uh, in principle, you, we could have um, video stimuli of, of, a, of a scenario of someone not having health insurance and getting cancer or getting uh, in a bad car accident, and you would upload your picture, and we would put your own face in this video, and, and maybe even using virtual reality uh, headsets, have someone, a day in the life of your horrible future, unless you buy health insurance today. Now you put this out there publicly, and we're going to have to do this. Yeah. To figure out how to do it. I don't know. <laughs> it's a good idea. Way to, way to torque your pri the priors <laughs> of the, the subjects. Um, you might want to give them some probabilities of the likelihood if you... <laughs> You wanted to make it concrete, but still realistic. And, and I would just Tony. add to that, just that you know, economists have this sort of well, this expression of that. Well, we 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 believe we believe what people do, not what they say. So uh, you know, in other words, we believe in revealed preference uh, as the ultimate you know arbiter of their behavior, rather than what they say, because there's a lot of things that go behind why somebody answers a question a certain way that may or may not actually reflect. Um, you know, when the rubber hits the road and they actually have to make a decision, are they really going to, you know, in the privacy uh, of their own home, in their underwear buying insurance or whatever, you know, are they really going to buy the higher, the, the, the generosity framed one uh, versus, you know, a cheaper alternative? Um, and, and that's why there's been a huge move in the fields towards starting with these sort of lab studies and then moving forward to true field experiments. Yeah, no, th that's I'm, all, I'm all for that. You know, I, I think that, that, that that's right. That's the right direction. Other questions from the audience? Please, right over here. 
Hi, thank you, Betsy Weand. I uh, have a comment, not so much a question, about the return of premium policies. So in a past life, I spent five years with the American College of OBGYNs, and so uh, just had a comment about how you would treat pregnancy care uh, as a benefit that you were using, because it is preventive care if you're using prenatal care, but you wouldn't necessarily want to discourage people from having children, considering our declining fertility rate. Yeah, I mean, so that's a really good point. There are lots of details that we need to be worked out about this, and that's like my number one concern, I would say, in addition to you know what percentage would you actually be able to return of the premiums, but you really do not want to deter people from getting needed care, and pregnancy would be one good example. But then if you do have to pay for pregnancy expenses, then obviously that lowers the percentage that you're able to return. So um, you know, there's also a possibility that as we're talking about segmenting, that maybe the return of premium policies are not right for certain populations compared to others as well. But this is also a form of moral hazard to the extent that you think that pregnancy is an expensive cost for the insurer. There's gonna be a limit to a, to a private law solution. You know, the insurer doesn't care about our demographics of, you know, birthing in the United States and, you know, the insurer cares about, you know, their risk pool. So being able to discourage their insurance from getting pregnant, uh, if that's the moral hazard, then that would be a way to achieve that and segment the risk pool. We've already been experimenting for over a decade with advanced return of premium uh, policies. They're called health savings accounts, where you get the lower premium and you get the money. Now, the problem is we get conflicted, saying, well, people aren't going to then spend money on the care they need the evidence is mixed on that because the long-term savings, at least from the recent research, indicate people do treat it as an extra insurance benefit, and ultimately there aren't a lot of large balances over time on net. So we end up just treating it as another tax-advantaged way to spend money on health care. Which those of us in the healthcare sector like a lot. Uh, <laughs> additional questions from the audience or comments? Anybody? Please, over here. Thank you. Bill Arnone with the National Academy of Social Insurance. A few months ago, AEI had a forum, and one of the speakers was from a relatively new company called Bind, where they are selling health insurance on demand, contradicting the points you made about when we buy home uh, insurance, auto insurance, you buy it just when you need it. Have any of you looked at that concept? And they're still in business. Uh, what's your reaction to it? Yeah, I haven't seen the follow-up data on it. As, as you know, if you've got enough experience in healthcare markets, all kinds of products are rolled out. You need to see whether in practice they deliver what they're trying to do, and sometimes it's finding a market niche. But I organized that conference, and it was certainly an interesting presentation. Again, it's running in a direction different than what other policy wants to try to make more uniform and all in this together. And the question is, do you want to have a market which reflects different preferences, or do, are there some overriding goals which say, no, you're all in this together and we're going to uh, censor some of those extreme preferences because we have other reasons to want to grab your money and put it somewhere else? I'll just mention that you know we, we throw around the word insurance, and Tony was talking in his presentation about what the purpose of insurance is, is to indemnify for catastrophic costs. Um, and so in that sentence, the word insurance is being used in a, in a technical sense. But um, when we throw a function, even after the house is on fire, to, bu to buy loss of the mandate penalty, um, what was the evidence on how well the penalty worked? Because I, I remember there was a lot of discussion about how low the penalty actually was and whether it, in fact, discouraged people from not buying insurance. Yeah, so I mean... It it's an excellent question to which I think there is not a uh, completely clear answer. I think it was effective to a degree. I think it is hard for people to separate out the effect that the subsidy had versus the effect of the, the individual mandate penalty. The one thing that I do in the paper is I say we can at least draw on the experience that Massachusetts had before the federal experiment with the individual mandate because they had a system of subsidies already in place when they implemented the mandate. So you can study the effect that the mandate had as separately from the subsidy. And there it did have um, a significant effect. Um, there, I think, again, there are, uh, there are certainly disputes about um, the percentage of people that signed up for health insurance in the private market. So I'm putting Medicaid expansion to the side. 
who's for engaging in this conversation. I don't think that there's a single you know, cure for all of our solutions in any of this, um, but I, I guess my concern is that sometimes uh, you know, we consider the perfect as the enemy of the good, and so I'm really uh, hopeful that maybe we will see some actual natural experiments. We'll see some insurance companies try some different things uh, and really try to focus attention on this problem of the uninsured. So thank you all for coming. Thank you.